at last. We've been looking forward to being in these easy chairs with the water and the table for months. <laughs> Because we were working together, working and working and working, and then serendipitously today. Um, today. That was an amazing talk. Thank you. You covered so many, wow, it is so bright in here. Do I look like I'm just like about to have an operation? <laughs> you covered so many different areas. And um, so I wrote down a few questions. Um, uh, one thing that comes to mind that um, number of 70 million that you mentioned mm -hmm. of people who have impediments through arrest or conviction and therefore are made vulnerable and have to find work in a more precarious or informal economy. When we were working on the piece, um, the New York Times said they called, they spoke extensively to a statistician at the Bureau of Justice Statistics mm -hmm. who said that the number is actually 100 million, Great. but they couldn't use it because they said we haven't figured out how to adjust for dead people mm -hmm. and people who have multiple convictions across state lines, mm -hmm. but it may be even more. And, this, and if it's 100 million, then it's more than the number that comprises the American workforce, mm -hmm. basically, people who have. Pushing it, pushing it. The workforce is around 150 million, just about. Um, not including all the children who are exploited by their parents, you know, working on the farm and renting the bodega and whatever. There's, there's also that, but the official workforce. So you mentioned um, this classic Communist Party line mm -hmm. of, um, my name is Ruthie Gilmore, and I'm here to help you solve your problems. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it somehow brings home the idea that abolition practical door-to-door -door campaign work and the kind of work that it is on other levels is about trying to figure out how to help people with their daily life and the problems mm -hmm. that they do experience and the ways in which their needs are not being met. It's not just about closing prisons. That's exactly right. That is exactly right. Abolition is not just about closing prisons. In fact, that doesn't make any sense in the larger scheme of things because closing prisons, which is generally a good idea, um, doesn't resolve all of the other problems that combined to make this enormous prison expansion program that all of the United States uh, experienced in one way or another happen. So um, the two stories that I just told in detail give you some, you know, broad set of insights into the different kinds of struggles people are having, in some cases struggles that also involve conflict, like the farmers and the farm workers in Tulare County, and, or the guards union and the non-guards union in, in the California state, as well as the ways that people figure out how to resolve those issues, at least provisionally, to do something else. Right. And the prisons themselves aren't really solving these people's daily life problems either, right? Prisons don't solve anything. Right. Um, you, had the you told me a story about working with the mayor of, which town was it, um, where you figured out that the jobs that were promised by the California Department of Corrections um, were way pie in the sky numbers. And in reality, you counted how many? They, 72. They promised how many? They promised 1,600. 1,600 jobs for a community that probably had n n not a huge community. No, 27,000 people, maybe. So, it's so like that's a significant jobs number of jobs. jobs. Yeah. A lot of jobs. Yeah. Um, and in fact, they had 72. Maybe. 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 So. So, so here's the kind of thing that a nerd can do <laughs> that's useful. So if you have nerdly inclinations, go with it. Um, one of the things that happens for any big project of any kind, um, well, at least until the current administrations in Washington and elsewhere obliterate um, the rules, uh, is that a big project has got to produce an environmental impact statement or report. 
And the statement or report, although the first word is environmental, is not only about the um, effect that the project will have on what might, one might think of as nature or the natural environment. It's actually the entire environment, which includes the built environment, it includes the cultural environment, it includes the employment environment, it's actually everything. Um, the problem with how many, I won't say all, but many environmental impact reports and studies that I have read um, uh, display is that the work is done to comply with the letter, not the spirit of the law. They're really badly put together. They're not well intellected, although they're done by people with PhDs in geography like me. I mean, people who went to the same school I went to, so I know they learned how to do things properly. They don't have to, because their job is to crank these things out quickly. So they do, again, to the letter of the law. And um, so in combing through uh, the Delano, uh, Delano II prison environmental report, you know, I read the employment thing, and I read it, and I read it, and I read it, and I said, I think I can figure out how few of these jobs will actually stick in this community. So I did the arithmetic. It, was, it wasn't even higher math. It was just arithmetic. And um, came up with 72. Then I turned it all over to my research assistant, this great guy, guy called Pete Spinagle. And Spinagle redid the numbers, and he came up with 72. Then I went and got a PhD student in statistics, because maybe it was statistical and not a, arithmetical. And she did it, and she came up with 72. So here's the funny thing. I just want to tell this little other story. So I came up with it. We publicized this everywhere we could. We talked about it in the streets of Delano, door to door. Um, we just told people, this is the best that will happen. Along the way, a New York Times reporter, the other time I ever talked to the New York Times, although I didn't really, I just talked to you and the fact checkers. Um, uh, uh, a reporter called Evelyn Nieves called me to ask me about my findings. So I talked to her for, I don't know, like two hours on my cell phone. And this was the year 2000 when talking on a cell phone was really, really costly. Um, so I spent two hours on my cell phone talking to her and plugging it in and talking to her and convinced her of the veracity of my claims. And then she went and talked to the mayor of Delena. And she told him what I told her. And he said, well, here's the problem that I face. This town is doing so badly that even 72 jobs or something wow. is not a number I can turn my nose up at. But in the New York Times story, nobody fact-checked this, the, the number was attributed to the mayor of Delano, not to the professor in Berkeley. But I not really, my New, New no, York Times no, no, story. No, 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 this is back in 2000. And at first, of course, my feelings were hurt because I oh, I did all that arithmetic. Um, <laughs> but then I thought, well, how much better could it be than for the mayor of the town to say the number than for some outsider with an office at a fancy university in the Bay Area to say the number? So I was actually pleased to have been ripped off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So about like the environmental justice conference and um, like the the general types of struggles that people who live in the Central Valley face, I thought it would be worth even go going into that a little more in depth. When you really look at it, it's quite stark. They have the worst air in the nation. One million people drink poisoned water. Um, they, you know, I think it's like the highest concentration of minimum wage jobs in America, in, in Fresno, that I, from what I've read. In any case, so what, if you could generally explain, like, there's, there's money going into prisons. I mean, let's say it's plateauing now, or it has mm -hmm. plateaued, although California still spends quite a bit of money on corrections, and in fact, even despite the Supreme Court order to reduce the prison population in 2011, their costs are still going up. They reduced it by 20% um, in 10 years, I believe, or in the last five years. And it's gone up 7% because guards are getting wage increases and pensions cost money mm -hmm. and all of that. So why is there money for, for that? Mm -hmm. But there isn't money to provide basic services to people who live in the region that grows a great deal of the United States' food. Mm -hmm. 
political will. I mean, that's why. It's, the money exists. Um, the political will to determine how the money spent isn't strong enough to spread the money to the people who should have it. And the political will for prisons is very strong. It remains strong, although it's not as strong as it was, not in California in, and not in general in the United States, although the political will for jails, you might think a prison and a jail are the same, they're not, um, has been rising, kind of ticking up for two reasons. OK. Um, I'm, shall I stray into jails? Yes, I will. Sure. I shall stray into jails. I'll leave us back if we need to go back. 24 minutes and 41 seconds left. Jails. <laughs> jails are, uh, so prisons are, are establishments where people will serve a sentence if the sentence handed down is for a year and a day or more, even if they don't do the year and a day, if that's what the sentence is in the conviction. Um, uh, jail is for a year or less. And so jails tend to have people uh, moving through them a lot more. There's a lot of churn in jails. Most of the people who are in jail in the United States are there waiting um, for trial because they can't afford bail. I'm going to show you something. There we go. So you can just have facts. Um, uh, are awaiting trial, and then some people are actually serving sentences. But there's been a lot of movement on the part of county sheriffs, and there are 3,100 counties in the United States, to expand their jail cap capacity. Why? One, because as state prison systems feel crunches because of uh, unfavorable court rulings, this is the California case, or uh, because of legislative changes in budgeting priorities, as has happened in some other states, the legislatures have at the same time changed sentencing rules for certain kinds of convictions so that it becomes uh, impossible for the counties where everybody's convicted for all of these things to send them to the state. They have to keep them at the county. And so the counties say, well, we have to expand our jail. The other reason, which has been very compelling in many counties, is the counties are expanding capacity assuming that they can rent the capacity to ICE or the US Marshals. And this is happening all over the United States. And that actually, um, although people are often frothing at the mouth about private prisons in the ICE arena, um, the fact is a lot of the private contracts under which uh, uh, detained people, Im people under immigrant detention are being held, are contracts with county jails. It's happening all over the United States, and it's been happening for quite some time. Um, so these things are happening. So again, the political will to funnel the money into the jails is there. The political will to funnel money into expanding rural hospitals that have been grievously depleted is not. A building is a building. An employee is an employee. So the difference is politics. It's not dollars. If you don't remember anything else I said tonight, please remember that and remember this. Oh, I have one more thing. <laughs> oh, we're on the remembering thing. This is about private prisons. I'm going to stand aside so everyone can see it. All right, growth of private prisons. So you see the line at the top and you say, whoa. You see down here is low, low yellow line. That's the growth of private prisons. This. The yellow line down here, not up there. Up there is all the prisons. This is private prisons as a portion of all the prisons. Now we come back here and we say, when did prisons start to grow? They started to grow in the late 1970s. And I can explain all that in great detail in another time when I come to the Lannan Foundation, <laughs> which I'd be happy to do. All right, so prison growth starts, late 70s, early 80s. Where do the privates start taking off? After. They're parasites. They're parasites. They're parasites. If every single contract, every single contract were ended tonight, how many people do you think would be released tonight? Zero. Zero. They're not in prison because of the private contracts. Zero. It's just that the public entity would take over management. 
That's, that's the difference between public and private in this country. All right. Off my soapbox. Now Back to is, my chair. This is very important. And once you become attuned to it, it, um, it's impossible not to be frustrated and even slightly enraged because it's so ubiquitous to hear from people that say, who say, oh yeah, I mean the private prisons. There's something about a profit motive that really gets under people's skin and then they decide that that's the thing we need to get rid of. Mm -hmm. You know, going after profits is not a bad thing. It's a good thing. But, like, you know, wage increases is a way to go after profits. And uh, having uh, wealthy individuals and corporations pay their fair share of taxes. Go back to the Eisenhower era. If you want to know what fair is, it's 90%. Um, Eisenhower, Republican. Um, uh, that, that having people pay their fair share of taxes uh, is a way to go after profits. There are many ways to go after profits. In the case of prisons, um, uh, because people, I think, are trying quite genuinely to come to some understanding of what capitalism, uh, capitalism has to do with all this, um, we'll look at something, a corporation, and corporate is one of those dirty adjectives, corporate power, corporate this, corporate that, and say, well then, now we can see what the problem is. It all must come from there. Now, my argument in my book, and my argument that I very lightly outlined at the beginning of my talk tonight is the problem is capitalism. The problem is capitalism, saving capitalism from capitalism. But how that works out should not be confused with how we follow the money. And not all money is profit. So when we follow the money from the state budgets through the prisons, where, do, where does it go? It goes into wages and salaries whether for the guards or the teachers or the locksmiths or the um, secretaries. The money that goes through the prisons also goes to something that produces profits, such as utility companies. That's one of the biggest expenditures for prisons, which is not surprising because a prison is a city. And so the lights never go off. The lights never go off. So utility companies get huge chunks of the annual budget of any prison or jail for that matter. Where else does it go? Debt service. Not all, but almost all of the prisons and jails built in this new era, so starting at the beginning of this, is the graph still there? Yeah, starting at the beginning there, um, were built with debt, right? So that debt service means paying back a loan. If debt service sounds like jargon. Paying back a loan that was lent to the state or the county or the city to build the jail. And when the state or the county or the city go off to investors and say, would you lend us money to build a jail? They also say to those investors, we promise we'll keep it full because if we don't keep it full, then we don't have to pay you back the, the loan. Right? This is really different from looking for the private prison. It's really different, even though there's a profit there. Um, so there's debt service, there's utilities, there's wages and so forth. And then there are all the other parasitical things that come into play that you probably know about. For example, how um, it's, it's extremely expensive for somebody in prison to call out, and it's not that cheap for somebody outside to call in. Um, it's extremely expensive for people to get um, it's what's called canteen, like you know, sneakers or better toothpaste or whatever things you know, people might want inside because the states have given contracts to the equivalent of like prison Amazon, but it's not Amazon yet, but it will be, um, <laughs> to provide all of the approved goods that prisoners are allowed to have and there's a huge markup on it because it is quite literally a captive audience, right? And so the families have to pay the extra money, whereas they could just go down to the you know, Target or wherever and buy the sneakers, put them in a box, take them to the post office, send them off for you know, $20 instead of $80. So there's profit extracted there. But the, all of those profit um, opportunities are parasitical. Does that mean it doesn't matter? Of course not. It matters. But make a campaign that's going to matter for the lives of the people 
for whom you think you're struggling. And again, ending a prison contract does not relieve anybody who's locked up of one minute of time that they owe to that building, including people in indefinite detention, which is the case with many um, undocumented people and people scheduled for deportation. When you talk, like when you were giving your talk and just now, I'm reminded I come back again and again to a pretty basic concept that doesn't cease to be important to me to think about how prisons work. And I know we're talking very specifically about California, but it, it, correct me if you feel I'm wrong, but I do consider California a kind of like a lightning rod. And it has something to do with, um, it's a, a writ large version of the way capitalism has worked in the United States since the decline of the manufacturing age. You know? <laughs> and we send people from large urban areas, Southern California, I think 65% of people in prisons in California come from the larger metropolitan area of Southern mm -hmm. California, Los Angeles. And then they're put on buses and taken to these totally rural locations in the middle of industrial farming. That's pretty bizarre when you think about what it is as a solution, as you would say, to social problems. But the thing I come back to is that prisons, um, over this last 40 years of a dense, concentrated, busy building of new prisons, um, they aren't built because of need. It's not like the county jails were burgeoning with people that ha were going to then have to be put on buses. I mean, not have to, but mm -hmm. had been um, you know, court ordered to be put on buses to fulfill their commitment to the state. They get built, and then they end up, and then the state becomes very good at filling them. Mm -hmm. And this is why the Supreme Court told California that you can't build your way out of the problem. Can mm -hmm. you explain a little more about how mm -hmm. that works? Like they build a prison and... The next day it's over. It's, so they, it's they can't too. ever um, solve the problem of overcrowding through expansion. Right, because overcrowding actually for the system is not a problem other than when people take them to court over the conditions of confinement. So the theory that the attorneys used in pursuing the 20 year long case about premature death due to medical neglect was a theory that said, ah, the reason people in prisons in California, prisons for men and prisons for women, um, are dying because of neglect is that because the prisons are so overcrowded that the medical staff cannot attend to people in a timely way. The legal staff tried a number of different theories, and this is the one that worked. So don't confuse the theory with what, you know, the full story of what people inside were talking about, complaining about what the problems were with the medical staff, staffing and the neglect of, of people in prison. Um, so there was like much more active neglect than, oh, the doctor can't make his way through the hordes to see somebody who's suffering from something that turns out to be fatal. That is not the case at all. Um, and so what happened in that case was um, after several separate cases found their way eventually to a preliminary court hearing of the Ninth District of the federal um, system, the federal court system, the Ninth D District being notoriously the most quote unquote liberal of all of the federal court districts in the United States, that district ordered the several cases to join up into one case. So they did, after years of working separately, although all the lawyers knew each other and talked to each other a lot. Um, and then the, the case became one case, and the Ninth District actually was the one that had ruled that California had to reduce the number of people in prison, it could not build its way out of the problem, and they didn't have to reduce the number of people who were in its custody. They had to reduce the number of people held in the actual physical plant that California had. So one of the things California did, as you know, was they shipped some people out of state and rented beds elsewhere. So that would have looked like private prisons, although most of the rented beds were in public facilities elsewhere. Um, and then those people started coming back as certain changes to sentencing made it possible for people to get eventually be released instead of just shuffled around. And so that's what led to the, the reduction in the number of people in prison. And the other reason there was such a dramatic reduction in the number of people in prison in California was a concerted campaign on the part of people 
advocating on behalf of people in prisons for women that the, that the state not build those new prisons that I talked about for like two seconds in my talk, um, but rather take seriously the original mandate that the commission overseeing that project had had, which was to identify um, 4,000, at least 4,000 people in prisons for women who, quote, shouldn't be there. Now just think about that conceptually, right? And think about making up a number and saying 4,000, 2,000, 5,000, 6,000. Think about it. And think about what kind of manifestation of a flickering political consciousness shaped that call and then ask yourselves, because I don't have time to do it tonight, how it is possible that a state commission would have come up with such um, a call if it had not been for the abolitionist work happening on the ground over and over and over and over and over and over again elsewhere. When you talk about gender responsive prisons, I mean, I'm familiar with that campaign because mm -hmm. I knew some of the people, um, some of the incarcerated people who signed the document that they did not want a new building um, built and designed in their names. But when I think of it, I think of those um, razors that are marketed for women and they're pink, but it's just a goddamn razor. They don't change <laughs> anything about it yeah. except how it looks. And it seems like they were saying, or were they responding to the mood of the times by coming up with what they thought would be um, a prison, but that would kind of be housed in the appropriate sheep's clothing? Yes, very sheepy, very sheepy. <laughs> so the idea was, actually a throwback to California state prison policy in the late 30s and early 1940s. And the idea was this. Um, because prisons in the period from the late 1890s forward were, and in fact, all modern prisons, but particularly those, um, were designed kind of based on the assumption that the person held in the prison was going to be a healthy young man. And that the you know, effects of being locked up you know, in the cold or in the wet or in the stone or in silence or in enforced work or you know, what have you um, was something that was going to be visited on the person of a healthy young man. So if you think about the military, the military is also based on that model. The assumption is that the recruit will be a healthy young man. And it's probably still, even though the desegregation of the, of the armed forces has continued apace, that that's the thinking. So um, many people uh, trying to advocate for people who didn't fit that profile would say, prisons are bad for elderly people because they're not healthy young men. Prisons are bad for women because they're not healthy young men. And prisons are bad for children because they're not healthy young men. The unfortunate sort of blowback of that was that those kinds of arguments, and I was guilty of them too, uh, for a while. You just named all these people we can build prisons for. Exactly. Old men, young exactly. children. So, you know, we weren't reducing anything. We were just like giving opportunities. So just as capitalism saves capitalism from capitalism, oh, yuck, we've got all this pollution. Let's, you know, get, put some money into the hands of some inventors who are going to figure out something that eventually will have this huge IPO that will solve the pollution problem, as one of my chemical engineer friends is always trying to do at the University of Houston, you know, filing patents on, almost on a daily basis. Anyway, back to the prison. So this, these arguments produced the possibility of a certain kind of opening, which again, at first, when the Gender Responsive Strategies Commission was formed, um, they put out a call to the wardens, uh, wardens, yes, who ran the three, four then, prisons for women in California to identify people who could be released. But then people talked in probably not smoke-filled rooms because it was after indoor smoking had been banned. <laughs> but morally, that's where they were. And <laughs> they said, well, no, instead of doing that, let's just build better prisons. So they, you know, so I mentioned that this was a throwback to prison reform in the late 30s and 40s. Up until like the early 40s, uh, women in California prisons were just housed in a different part of the prisons for men. 
And then they built these cottages in Tehachapi for women prisoners. There's a Barbara Stanwyck movie in which you see a scene where she's wearing like a little house dress and an apron with pockets. Yeah. And they really did build these prisons to be for women and to be like, here you can pretend to run your household until some t such time as you get out and have a household which none of those women was going to have, right? Not a household with a cottage and the curtains and the apron, anyway. And I mean, wasn't there a time in the United States when we didn't even have prisons for women, basically? They or very of, few? They kind of lifted off in the end of the 19th century with the rise of the progressive movement. So capital P, progressivism. I don't call myself a progressive for the following reason. Capital P, progressivism, was a movement on the part of mostly elites who are part of the competitive capitalist world. So what do I mean competitive capitalists? I mean they weren't the monopoly capitalists. They weren't the big railroad owners and those other people who had so much unobstructed uh, power and authority throughout the United States. So progressivism arose um, to enable the competitive capitalist class to go up against the monopoly capitalists and through the dis, um, development of large scale and complex governmental institutions, figure out how to extract value from labor and land. So you get all kinds of terrific things like uh, schools, uh, more expansion of schools and expansion of compulsory public education and uh, health um, departments and uh, various uh, improvements to the infrastructure for sewage and so on and so forth. All kinds of fantastic things came out of this government. But also what grew up alongside progressivism was an expansion of criminalization and imprisonment, an expansion and consolidation of certain kinds of hierarchies depending on one's foreignness as well as race combined. Um, so Nayan Shah has written about this in the context of uh, San Francisco's Chinatown. And what also was, grew up with progressivism was Jim Crow, right? So apartheid and progressivism go together. And if you study progressivism as it moved around the world, you see they grew, grew together in places like South Africa, in mandate, Palest mandatory Palestine, as well as places like Mexico City. So this is the problem that we face is actually undoing the reforms of capital P, right. progressivism. Well, um, is it, does it make sense to think that um, looking back upon a time, it's not a simpler time, but a time in which women had not become heavily criminalized and there were not so many institutions for women or maybe barely any at all, um, is it helpful to look back on that in order to try to imagine a time now when you can have public safety and you can have a calm civil order without mm -hmm. having these gigantic concrete places that women are being funneled into, like mm -hmm. to think that we don't need them because women are not fundamentally different than they were before. They're mm -hmm. not more, more violent or more devious or prone to the kinds of things the state thinks they need um, mm -hmm. you know, to convict women of. And, put them in these prisons. I mean, it, is it helpful to imagine that we could live like that again, or that the fact that those prisons were not there and have been developed by what you've outlined to me are not arbitrary reasons, but not inevitable reasons? Mm -hmm. Like, this happens or that happens. The guards union gives uh, a California governor a million dollars, and then he builds them a new prison. If prison is kind of, the building of prison is kind of separate from what happens to people in their lives and when they, you know, the, the kinds of struggles that they have or the decisions that they make or, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like, so those two things are separate. Can we imagine again that, you know, that we can get along perfectly fine just to mention one population group like women? Mm -hmm. Well, I think we can. Oh my God, the countdown. I know. I was trying to kind of, you know, <laughs> arrive at a... Uh... All right. I, I think that rather than try to look backward, yeah. we ought to look forward. And, by look, and in order to look forward, we should remember the history, as the Aymara teach us, teach us, is in front of us. So as we go forward to um, whatever future might unfold, we can think about um, and see 
around us how people already are living differently, how people's living differently might be derived from historical experiences of groups and places and so forth, so we can see that in the history that's before us. Um, and we can also see uh, quite uh, decisively how the various ways that people figure out how to learn to do new things to solve new problems. I'm not talking about violence, I'm talking about problems in general. People learn to do new things to solve new problems or bring old solutions to bear on new problems or new solutions to bear on old problems all can coalesce bit by bit into the creation of and the expansion of abolition geographies. So even though we're out of time, I'm gonna tell one more story um, or two. So the, um, so one, here's history in, is in front of me and one of the great uh, chronicler of abolition in practice was the great, great, great W.E.B. Du Bois. And all of you should read Black Reconstruction in America if you want to call yourself educated or if you want to call yourself an organizer or an activist. It's a long book, some of it's a slog, but it's fantastic. And one of the things that Du Bois lays out in looking uh, at that period is he shows us how the people who wrote the official histories of Reconstruction kept not noticing what was in front of them, right? They kept not seeing what was in front of them. So they kept not seeing the ways that freedmen and others arranged themselves into uh, secure and sustainable communities by establishing public schools, by establishing local governments, by establishing relationships between and among towns, by situating themselves in such a way that they could gather together when threatened and spread out and live their lives um, separately when not. And one of the things that Du Bois says in that book, in a footnote, always read the footnotes, is the experience of the Negro worker during Reconstruction provides the researcher with the opportunity to study inductively the Marxian theory of the state. So I say this not because all you all should join me in being excited about studying the Marxian theory of the state, although it's not a bad thing to do, but rather to think about how Du Bois in saying those things incites our analytical and perceptive imagination to think about the world we actually see now and to think about the various ways it congeals and can change into a different world. One of my oldest friends is in the audience. Her name is Ann Nelson. Some of you know her. And she worked for many, many years, and I've only heard a few of the stories, um, helping people uh, keep their Head Start programs vibrant when they were under threat of being closed. I think about that, why people would have to struggle to keep Head Start is already outrageous. But the stories that I've heard from the various places that she went over the years that she was doing this work give us insights into how people can pull themselves together, do pull themselves together in the things they actually want for their communities. So I had to learn not to say to people, why do you want this prison, but rather to ask people, what do you want? It's like totally different. What do you want and how can we get to it? Um, I worry a lot about thinking that there was a golden age uh, in American history that if only we could get back to, we'll be fine, because it didn't exist. Well, I, w I wasn't trying to I know, to play. but <laughs> I need to say it for the audience. Yeah. <laughs> I know you don't okay. think that, but just in case anyone in the auditorium thinks that, I just want to say that, that back is not the place. We're still dealing with the uh, contradictions, ongoing contradictions of settler colonialism. We're still dealing with the... Un ongoing contradictions of racism. We're still dealing with the fact that as capitalism saves capitalism from capitalism, the exploitation of human and other natural resources is producing a climate catastrophe. These are all concerns for abolitionists. I mentioned the lowly Tipton kangaroo rat. We actually care about the rat too. And finally, one thing I would like to say is because abolition in the United States is 
understandably enough, so strongly associated with anti-slavery movements. Many people imagine either that abolitionists only care about black people, nothing could be further from the truth, or that abolitionists are really talking in a cagey and, and subtle way about um, uh, some fact which is not actually correct, that um, people are in prison so that their labor can be exploited in there. That also is not true. And the movie The 13th did a great disservice to many people by making you think that the problem of prisons arrived when the 13th, 13th Amendment was ratified. That is not the case. Convict leasing started on these shores in British colonial North America in 1620. And the, lease, the convicts who were leased were white people, I mean people who became white. They weren't white, but their descendants are all white. So if you've heard of Georgia, you know about convict leasing. If you've heard of Australia, you know about convict leasing. This is not something that emerged after the end of the Civil War um, that then turned into chain gangs and then turned into mass incarceration. That is a comforting story because it's a story that makes it sound like there are a lot of innocent victims who we can care about. How about we get away from thinking, oh, they're innocent victims. We've got to step, step up and be empathetic and instead say, what are the political and social and economic problems that face us? How do those, face, those problems um, uh, coordinate the fact of mass incarceration, the fact of mass deportations, the fact of ongoing contradictions of settler colonialism? And what should we do as people who can organize ourselves as school children, union members, artists, um, writers, all of the ways that we can organize ourselves to do the work that we need to do to transform carceral geography into abolition geography. Well, that is a very impressive way to end. Wow. Um, thank you, Ruthie. And she will be in the back signing books. I will? That's what I was told. Oh. <laughs> I'll be in the yeah. back signing books. Oh. I and I'll be say, back there too. Can I say, say something hi? which is not apropos of anything but everything? Um, in, in the beautiful article that Rachel wrote, and it is so beautiful because Rachel wrote it, um, she shows how one of the people, she shows a lot about how one of the most important people in my life influenced me, and that was my father. And today is the 101st anniversary of his birth, and we are here, and the article came out. So happy birthday, Daddy. Yeah. <laughs>